hello and welcome. It's wonderful to have you here today. We kick off our series, our new series over the next five weeks, looking at our RBC values. As a leadership, we were keen to develop a set of cultural values that would, would drive the kind of environment and, and culture uh, that is in line with the best parts of our history as a church as well as uh, the, our sense of who we are and who God is inviting us to become into the future. Now, these values are, are not statements of belief or theology. We've got those already as a church and uh, as a movement. But these are rather essential statements about who we are and what we are on about here at RBC. A real helpful way, I think, of understanding our values as those are the, these are the things that matter most to us. These are the things that are, are most important to us. And so over the next five weeks, I'll be opening up these uh, values uh, for us to engage with and to look to give greater expression to across the life of RBC and in your life. And today we're looking at our first value, that of being Jesus-centered. Jesus is the one that we follow and the center of who we are and all we do. In the first century, ancient Greek philosophers thought and taught that the earth was the center of the universe. They taught that the earth was stationary and that the sun and the moon and the, the stars and all the, all the space debris and everything revolved around the earth. And this remained for a long time, this view, nearly 1400 years until 1543 when Catholic canon and uh, mathematician and astrologer Copernicus rocks up and he says, excuse me, uh, I'm sorry to be the one to break the news, but we are not the center of the universe. The earth is not the center of our solar system. The sun is. And the earth and all the other planets and the stars, they all revolve around the sun. Now, this news wasn't well received by, uh, by many people, and Copernicus got in big trouble, in fact, for even suggesting it. You see, here's the thing, none of us like to uh, be relegated, none of us like to not be the centre of everything, because from our perspective, everything does seem to revolve around us. But here's the thing, you and I, we are not centre stage. And in the same way as Copernicus shared the news that the earth wasn't the center of the universe, the scriptures tap you and I on the shoulder and they say, hey, look, look over there. See Jesus? He's the center of the universe. He's the center of all things. It all revolves around him. Have a look what Paul says. Paul puts it this way in Ephesians 1. God raised him, Jesus, from death and set him on a throne in deep heaven in charge of running the universe everything from galaxies to governments no name and no power exempt from his rule and not just for the time being but for ever he is in charge of it all has the final word on everything at the center of all this christ rules the church don't you love that? You see, church, this value reminds you and I of something important. And that is that we don't start with ourselves, but we start with Jesus. Jesus is the center of it all. Jesus is, it's all about him. So let's look a little further at why this value is one that matters most to us. Well, firstly, from beginning to end, it has always been about Jesus. Take a look at 1 Colossians, uh, Colossians 1. Paul writes, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things. So Jesus was before all things, the creator of all things. And then if we jump to the end of the story in the book of Revelation, we see that John has a vision and he sees Jesus centered in the center on a throne in the center of heaven as the centerpiece of eternity. Have a look. 
verse John, uh, Revelation 5, verse 11, John says, Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousand times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, Jesus, the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and praise. From beginning to the end, it has always been about Jesus. But he's also the one who is holding all things together here and now. Colossians 1.17 says, He is before all things and in him all things hold together. He's the beginning He's the end and he's the center of all things. H.G. Wells, prolific 19th and 20th century writer, said this. He said, I am a historian. I am not a believer, but I must confess as a historian that this penniless preacher from Nazareth, Nazareth is irrevocably the very center of history. I wonder, in what areas of your life is Jesus front and center? Are there any areas of your life where you are placing other things before Jesus? You see, right up front, this is an important question for us to wrestle with because that which we center our lives on shapes our future. It shapes who it is that we become. You see, spiritual formation is not a neutral thing. It's a contested space. And if Jesus is not your center, then someone or something else is shaping your future and who you become. So what areas of your life is Jesus front and center? Are there any areas of your life where you are placing other things or people before Jesus? Secondly, Jesus matters most to us because when people encounter and experience Jesus, everything changes. We see things differently. Take the transformation that happened in the life of the, of the Apostle Paul. Being born in Tarsus, Paul held significant standing in the Roman Empire. He also had elite status as a, as a Jew. His Jewish heritage and credentials were unrivaled. He was trained under the esteemed teacher Gamaliel, and his passion and zeal saw him persecute followers of Jesus. But after an encounter and experience of King Jesus, everything changed. Jesus became of absolute value to Paul and his greatest joy. For Paul, nothing mattered more than knowing Jesus. Jesus became the center of who he was and all he did. Look in Philippians 3, 7 to 10, how Paul describes this change. He says, the very credentials that these people are waving around as something special, I'm tearing up and throwing out with the trash, along with everything else I used to take credit for. And why? Because of Christ. Yes, all the things I once thought were so important are gone from my life compared to the high privilege of knowing Christ. Jesus as my master, firsthand, Everything I once thought I had going for me is insignificant. It is dog dung compared to knowing Christ. I've dumped it all in the trash so that I could embrace Christ and be embraced by him. You see, when people encounter and experience Jesus, everything changes. Jesus enables us to see things differently. What do we see differently when Jesus is front and center in our lives? Well, here's just a few things. You, you see people differently. You begin to see people the way Jesus sees them. You begin to see people for their potential, not their problem. You begin to see the image of God in people, not just their flaws and their brokenness and their fractures. You see your calendar differently. You see that time is a gift and that time is short. And so you prioritize your day around the things that matter most, not wasting time on trivial things. You see suffering differently. Without Jesus, suffering can seem meaningless. But with Jesus, you see that even in your greatest hurt and pain, he is there with you and there's a purpose. Nothing is wasted. You see money differently. You see your money as a gift, as something that has been entrusted to you by God for his purposes, not only 
for your own benefit. You see death differently. You see, when Jesus is the center of your life, you know that even when you die, it's not the end. It's only just the beginning. And you see your journey with Jesus differently too. Jump back to Philippians 3.10. I love what Paul goes on next and he says, he says this in verse 10, I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. What an attitude and approach to life. I want to know more of Jesus. Now, at the time of penning these words, let's remember that Paul had pioneered Christianity around the Roman Empire. He did more to spread Christianity in the first century than any other person. He ended up planting more than a dozen churches and wrote nearly half the New Testament. And yet here he is, still living with a hunger and a thirst in his bones to know more of Jesus. This is our heart as a church, to be a people humble enough and hungry enough to say, I want to know Jesus. I want to know Jesus more. I'm not someone who's going to be discontent to rest on what Jesus did in my life last year or even the year before. Rather, I want to be someone who has a new testimony every year, every month, every day, every moment of the grace of Jesus in my life. Of people who seek first Jesus and his kingdom and want a new encounter and experience of Jesus every day. You see, church, we believe that Jesus is for everyone and we are passionate about people encountering and experiencing him as their greatest joy. As a church, we celebrate seeing people transformed by uh, Jesus, being baptized. Just last week, I was down at Largs Bay with our Korean communion. We saw two people baptized. It was beautiful. It was a wonderful testimony to see. And we celebrate seeing people filled with his spirit and formed more into his likeness. We believe that there is no greater decision than any, that anyone can make than to say yes to Jesus. And we desire to be a church where people come in a faith is commonplace. Third, Jesus gives us our identity. Our modern culture is focused on discovering and defining one's own identity. At a popular level, our culture rejects any external norms and simply says, you do you, you do you. Christian author Jonathan Grant, he puts it this way. He says, modern culture encourages us to create our own beliefs and morality. The only rule being that they must resonate with the way we feel we really are. The worst thing we can do is to conform to some moral code that is imposed on us from outside by society, our parents, the church, or whoever else. It is deemed to be self-evident that any such imposition would undermine our unique identity. Personal meaning must be found within ourselves or just resonate with our one-of-a-kind personality. The problem with this approach is that because there is no center, there is no external point of reference, it ultimately creates a deep anxiety about who we really are and what our place in the world really is. Because the things that we resonate with and how we feel we really are, they're forever changing. And so we are forever seeking and chasing after our true self. But one of the wonderful gifts that Jesus gives us is a secure identity. Jesus gives us a true sense of self. And I love how John Tyson, author and pastor, puts it. He says, our culture is obsessed with identity. We've constantly being, we're constantly being told to find ourselves, discover our purpose, define who we are. But as followers of Jesus, our identity is not something we find, but something that's been given to us. We don't have to search for it. We just have to receive it. And so what is it that has been given to us? What is our identity? Well, Paul says it in Galatians 4, 7. He says, so you are no longer a slave, but God's child. You are a child of God. And in Colossians 3, we read, your old life is dead. Your new life, which is your real life, even though invisible to spectators, is hid with Christ in God. He is your life. 
You see, when you accept what Jesus has done for you, then your, prim your primary identity becomes one who is a child of God, one who is found in Christ. Christ is your life. Jesus is your life. He's your identity. He's your center. He's your true sense of self. However, in our Western culture, which places matters of wealth and gender, sexuality, power, political affiliation, race at the center of personal identity, then it can actually be tempting to define ourselves by these things rather than, as a, rather than by our primary allegiance to Jesus. But as followers of Jesus, our lives are to be defined by the simple yet profound truth that we are radically loved children of God and that we are in Christ. And as we follow Jesus, as we yield our lives to him, we are meant to lose our own identity and to take on his instead. You see, we're not meant to become better versions of ourselves as much as we are to become better reflections of Jesus. And when we settle this truth in our hearts, and when we get this right, the rest of life is much easier to navigate as a disciple. Number four, you can build your life on Jesus. He's your firm foundation. I wonder, what are you building your life on? What's the foundation of your life? If you are building a house or a high rise, the, the foundations matter, right? If you don't have foundations deep enough or built on the right soil, then you'll find that the integrity of the building will be compromised. Foundations are also important for your life and our church. Take a look at how the scriptures speak about Jesus. Hebrews says that he's our anchor. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Ephesians says that he's our, Paul says in Ephesians that he's our cornerstone. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And then in 1 Corinthians 3, Paul says that Jesus is our foundation. Remember, there is only one foundation, the one already laid, Jesus Christ. is our anchor, our cornerstone and our foundation. Church, you can build your life on Jesus. In Matthew 7.24, Jesus has just finished teaching what many regard as the greatest sermon ever, the Sermon on the Mount. And he closes with this warning. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Jesus says, if you hear my teachings and obey them, then you are a wise person. You see, doing what Jesus says or not doing it, this is what makes the difference between a house that stays upright in the storm or one that falls over and collapses. As a church, we are committed to the teachings of Jesus and learning to live out his words, his ways and his works in our lives. Why? Because it is wise. A Jesus-centered life is one that intentionally reorientates and reorganizes itself around the ways, words and works of Jesus. If you do this, you are building a solid foundation beneath you. The storms will come and they will beat upon your life, but you can be confident that you will make it through because you've got a good, solid foundation beneath you. Fifth, Jesus powers us. For life. This is why Jesus matters, because he powers us for life. Paul wrote in Colossians 1.29, To this end I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works within me. And in Philippians 3.10, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection. For Paul, he ran his life off of the resurrection power of Jesus What's powering your life today? What's running your life? If Jesus is not the power running your life, then here's the deal. You will conk out. It might not happen tomorrow, but it will happen. We need to have our lives powered by Jesus. 
So how do we tap into Jesus' power for us? Well, it happens as we prioritize time to just be with him. Many of us live at such a frenetic pace that we don't stop long enough to just sit with Jesus, to just linger with him. I'm convinced that being present to Jesus is the most countercultural thing that we can do as his disciples in our modern world. And I loved what Mike shared uh, last week. He said that we have got to stop crowding Jesus out. We have to give him room. And a Jesus-centered life gives Jesus room. It gives Jesus room to talk. It gives Jesus room to speak into your life. It leaves behind busyness distractions and trivial things that crowd him out. And as we do this, he will refill our tank and we will discover the restfulness of Jesus that we need, which is good for our spiritual and emotional health. And we'll also experience the power of Jesus for our everyday lives. And finally today, nothing matters more than Jesus Because Jesus is our salvation and our life. Church, this is good news. You see, for Jesus to be your salvation and your life is a wonderful thing. Acts 4.12 puts it this way. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. We are all in need of a saviour. Why? because we cannot save ourselves. Our good deeds aren't good enough. Our achievements aren't enough. Our accomplishments aren't enough either. The good news of the gospel, though, is that God loves you and that God knows you, that God formed you and created you. You matter to him. Your story matters to him. God saw our failures and our brokenness. He saw our self-reliance, our self-centeredness. He saw us wandering around in the dark without a light and without hope. And out of love for the world, not to condemn the world, but to save the world, God sent Jesus to us. And through his life, death and life again, Jesus made a way of salvation for all who trust in him. Jesus lived a life that we couldn't live. His deeds were perfect. His achievements on the cross were enough for you and I. He died so that we don't have to, and he rose so that we would experience new life here, now, today. And those who believe in Jesus are set free, are set free from sin, guilt, and shame, and are invited into God's family and a life without end one day jesus will return and when he comes he will renew and restore all things and set all things right again and on that that day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that jesus is lord and that he is the center of it all but for now you and i we are called to continue his mission of making disciples and renewing the world and to live our life for the glory of God and for the good of others. Just take a moment just to reflect and to, and to act. You see, it can be a challenge for us to consistently center our lives on Jesus. So what is one thing this week that you can do to take a step towards that reality? What's one thing you can do this week to take a step towards the reality of Jesus being front and center in your life. Just take a moment right where you are now to do that. And also just have a think. What is one thing that you can do this week, this month, to see this value lived out across the life of RBC? So not just in your life, but lived out across the life of RBC. You see, Jesus, he's the one who is before and the end of all things. All things find their place in him. He gives us our identity. Everything changes when we have an encounter with him. He is our power. He is our foundation for life. And he is our salvation and our 
life. This is why Jesus matters. This is why this is one of our values. Would you join me as we come and pray? King Jesus, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you love us. We thank you that you are the centre of all things. And Lord, right now, at the start of this series, we just place ourselves before you. We kneel before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we, we right-size you and we reposition you and reorientate everything around you because you are the centre of it all. We say sorry for the times where we have placed ourselves in the centre of the story. We are sorry for the times that we've made it all about us. But Jesus, we recognise that it's all about you. It's all for you. And so, Spirit of God, make Jesus real to us in a way that has never been before. We want to know more of Jesus in our life. We want to know more of his resurrection power in our life. And so, King Jesus, you are worthy of all the glory and all of the praise. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, it's been great to have you with us today. Next week, we will continue further in our series, looking at our second value, that of authentic community. You can follow uh, and reflect further on this uh, value by heading to the hub, the hub.rbc.org.au. And on the hub, on the front page there, you will find a a personal study guide that you can download or view and you can dig deeper into this series and each week of this of our values so I encourage you to do that but look forward to seeing you next week